uh, uh, function. How there's we looked at different ways that Kirk could understand that as far as uh, functioning and governing yourself, whether it's a uh, very hierarchical type thing, uh, where there's a leader at the top, um, a bishop and the archbishop and so on, or Presbyterian, where it's a little bit of a, a, a spread out as first uh, type of leadership or congregational. When you looked at what the scriptures say about uh, the responsibility that God, that Christ gives to the congregation in matters of discipline and matters of doctrine and look at different patterns along those lines. Now, when we talk about uh, this type of um, issue within the church, how a church functions and governs itself, how it orders itself, uh, to to accomplish the purpose and mission that God has given it. We often then go to the leadership of the church and the qualifications for the leadership of the church. And that is something that we will do and is something that is important to look at. So what are the qualities of those, the vital qualities of those who God has called and equipped and raised up to their lead in some capacity in the church? Now, what we're going to do today, though, is not that. What we're going to do today is what are the qualities of the congregation that are essential and necessary for the functioning of the church and the governing of itself? Uh, we can place a lot of emphasis on leadership, and that leadership is very crucial, and there's a very important role that leaders have within the church. But if the congregation is not, if the congregation is not uh, living uh, or becoming the the kind of people that God has intended, that Christ has intended his body would become, then in some respects, uh, there can be either overemphasis or underemphasis on leaders and their quality, but it's going to be very difficult for the church to function well if the congregation itself is not uh, in alignment with uh, who Christ is and what he's called them to be. So here's the question, and we'll, we'll pray and we'll uh, look at some passages related, but I'd like to kind of see what your thoughts are. What are the, the qualities, the vital, essential qualities of a congregation to, that are necessary to function uh, in fulfilling the, the, the mission that Christ is giving the church? Uh, what are the, the essential qualities of the church that are, that are necessary for, for ordering and governing it itself? Uh, what are those qualities? Uh, and that helps us understanding maybe what these qualities are of the congregation that are necessary for its vital, uh, for its functioning properly, then uh, means to examine in, in our own lives. Like, are, are, is, this, is this what's characterizing us as a church, as a people? Is this consistent with God's word? So that's the, the question. Uh, let's, God, let's ask God to help us as we consider that question and look at his word. Uh, to understand it a little bit uh, better. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity uh, together, to gather together this morning uh, to offer the sacrifice of praise uh, to you, this act, offer the sacrifice of our lives uh, to you this morning. We thank you for Jesus Christ, uh, for his sacrifice for our sins, Lord, that we can be reconciled to you, and much more, we can be a part of his body, a vital organism, Lord, in which your spirit is at work, in which uh, we have purpose and meaning and significance and connection uh, that that will extend on into eternity, Lord, far beyond what we could have ever imagined for ourselves or even still fully conceive of what it is that you are, are doing and in in us and, and through us, Lord. As we consider now how we are to function as the body of Christ and what is vital and necessary and what you have provided to that end, we ask that you would guide our study according to your word and toward, towards what is true, uh, that we would have better insight and better understanding of, of what it means to be the church of Christ, and that we would have uh, fuller hearts, warmer hearts, uh, towards towards fulfilling and becoming the kind of people, Lord, that you are you are producing uh, uh, in us and producing us to be uh, in the body of Christ. And I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so let me uh, then throw that question out there to you and uh, invite your your response. What are 
as you consider uh, in the few moments that we've had to think about it, pray about it, uh, uh, what are some of the qualities that you would see? These are essential qualities for a congregation to function in the way that God has um, intended and to accomplish its uh, mission. Yeah, first of all, it has to be Christ centered. Christ centered. There needs to be unity, and I'd say also diversity, like of gifts and how people are using them. Okay. Yeah, that was a good passage that uh, Brian yeah. uh, read uh, this morning to remind us of that unity and that the giftedness of the body uh, centered on uh, Christ. The, the body, after all. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah, Phil? Well, first, they have to be born again believers. Yeah. And they have to be following Christ and in his word and trying to follow the word of God. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So uh, we're not a part of the body of Christ until we're in Christ. And we're in Christ by trusting him, uh, repenting of our sin and, and trusting in him, and then li li living uh, uh, according to his word. Yeah. Good. Uh, other qualities. Yeah. Kevin. Say it again a little bit. Um, Jesus is one of the beautiful churches that and our family, especially early in Revelation, you see that love, faith, and zeal are three things that are really um, crucial. Yeah. Um, love for the Lord, for each other, faith in, in Christ, and then zeal to, to serve others and put others before yourself and to lose any of those and the future and start to die. Yeah, it's not going to function too well. Yeah, that's good. Good passages to look at. Consider, you know, what are they rebuked for uh, at churches? That would be an indication of what is important and valuable uh, within a congregation, within a church. Yeah, uh, other uh, insights as you kind of consider the, this question. Having a oneness of heart and mind for the things of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Not our ideas, it's his ideas. We yeah. need to know. Yeah. Yeah, we that that unity component of it. Like we all have, like how many of you have ways you think things should be done? Are you in church or whatever? They don't always line up. They don't line up with the same people in your your house. Uh, I think we should do this and this way. Uh, it's really hard. Unity is just not a, a natural uh, thing that that uh, flows automatically. Yeah, good. Uh, other uh, thoughts, sir. Words of the spirit and the mind. Yeah. yeah. Yep. If, if, if everybody was practicing all the words of the spirit, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Sure. Yeah, I think the church would be functioning pretty pretty effectively if all the fruits of the spirit, the, the fruit of the spirit, uh, it would be it would display and uh, evident in in our lives. Yeah. People using their gifts instead of just having them as one person do everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, to not just have the gifts, but to be uh, employing them, how that strengthens and builds up the, the church to accomplish its function, its purpose. Yeah, uh, yeah, these are, uh, yeah. And then also making disciples. Yeah, yeah, very key that if we're not making disciples, if we're not discipling, uh, that's probably the church going to be ill-equipped to function uh, as Christ is called uh, to. Yeah, I think spending some quality time together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, it's so important. Yeah, it seems that that has to be a, a necessary function of love. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, our relationships differ uh, for sure. We have different responsibilities, or but it's really hard to to love others uh, that you never see. Uh, like there, there's there's something actually there seems to be some important reason for coming together every week uh, that we would regularly see uh, one another and and at other times that God provides uh, for us in order to, to function in that way. Um, let's uh, so uh, yeah I think you, the, the question is kind of a little bit open ended because there's a lot of ways that the scriptures address this. Uh, this uh, how a church should function. But one of the things that kind of caught my attention in this is what Christ tells and begins to speak about on the night before he dies, the night before he's crucified. In fact, on that night, he starts talking about things that he had not talked to his disciples previously in the three years that he had been with them. 
So that's kind of an interesting thing. On the night before he dies, he starts teaching them about things that he had either not mentioned at all or, or just uh, alluded to or referred to uh, briefly in the prior three years. And one of those things that he mentioned on the night before, and might they be vital to the how a church functions, uh, how a congregation operates. So let's look at them together. I didn't do it, uh, the, the notes there, the exact uh, order in which he was instructing them. Uh, maybe I should have done it that way, but, but let's consider the uh, chapter 15 of, of the Gospel of John. And this is in the middle of some of the things that he has been uh, talking to them on that night. And this is, I think, a vital uh, quality for a congregation to function in the way that Christ has intended uh, it for it to accomplish its mission, its purpose as the body of Christ. Um, and so the, about the first 16 verses, the first half of this chapter, he uh, talks about this uh, quality of, of abiding in him. Let's, would somebody be willing to read um, uh, the first 10 verses? It will give us a, a good uh, sense of it, uh, this passage here. And what it's, uh, here. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband's. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purchaseth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear its fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. <laughs> If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it will be done to you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye may bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his. Okay, what's uh, what's Jesus? Instructing what's his instruction here to disciples on this uh, night before his death? Yeah. Bye. Bye. Any of you have a different uh, rendering of that uh, word in your translation? Some translations I think have remain uh, in me. Any of you got remain? Uh, yeah, remain or, or abide in me. Okay, uh, we're familiar with this. We've heard this before. Uh, so let's kind of think a little bit more carefully about this. What is he talking about? What is abiding? What is remaining in uh, Jesus Christ. What are we talking about when, uh, or what is Jesus talking about when he gives this instruction to uh, his disciples? Do what he says. Okay. Stay in and believe in him. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, do what he says. Uh, believe you're trusting in him and uh, reliance on him. Stay yielding. Uh, yielding. Yielding. Stay connected. Stay connected uh, to him. Remain intimate. Pardon? To remain intimate. Remain intimate. Okay. Uh, good. And and how how do we exactly do that? Is there even in, within the passage uh, kind of help on how this is going to be a kind of, uh, how does this come about? How do we remain connected to Jesus? How do we... Uh, yield to, to him. Like, how is this this, this happen? Keeping his commandments. Okay, his commandments. Uh, 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 to to obey uh, what he has said. Okay, good. To stay in his word. To stay in his word. Yeah. So let's look at that part particularly because he mentions his word a couple times. If we're going to remain in Jesus, it's more than just good vibes, right? right. More than just strong feelings. There is a, a provision that he's given to us. So he says, uh, verse 3, you are already clean because, why are they clean? Because the word. of the word that he had spoken to. Now, what does he mean that they are clean? What's he talking about? He just washed their feet a little bit earlier ago. Uh, is that what he's talking about? How, how did they become clean? By the word. By the repentance and the forgiveness. Yeah. By repentance 
uh, receiving forgiveness, the, the, the washing of the word, right? They, they recognized who Jesus was. They repented. They had trusted in him. They had, they had been clean. They had been morally clean. Okay? So you're already clean. Then he's like, all right, that's all I needed to tell. You guys are good, right? No, it doesn't stop there. Then he says, abide. All right? So you're clean. Now abide. Remain. Uh, remain in me and I in you. Uh, and then he gives the picture of a branch. This is a good area for that. We see plenty of grapevines, all right? Vine and branch is coming out. You, you see the vital connection uh, to that. The vine has no life in it apart from being connected to the branch. At this time of the year, once they start pruning stuff, everything that gets separated, cut off from the vine is done. Uh, just like the picture of this. You pick it up, you throw it away. It's not going to produce anything. There are not going to be any grapes on those uh, vines that are cut off from the, the, the branches that are cut off from the vine this year. But then uh, in verse five, uh, uh, what, what's this, this connecting that's remaining uh, to be produced? Uh, I am the vine, you are the branches, he abides in me and I am, he bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. And then uh, uh, verse seven, if you abide in me and my words, Abide in you. Ask whatever you want. So part of this abiding is his words. His words are, are we're continuing to hear them. We're, we're continuing to receive them. And it's, it's producing something uh, within us. Uh, in uh, uh, 16, uh, we, we didn't read that, but if you look down there, uh, you did not choose me. I chose you and appointed that you go and bear fruit. And that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask in the uh, in the uh, Father in my name, He may give you. So this vital connection to Jesus through His Word, hearing it and obeying it, heeding it, uh, would produce. It would be fruitful. Uh, so this this is I know uh, simple and straightforward, but it's something that we tend to uh, neglect. We want to base our, our, our relationship often on what we have done, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what we have done. Uh, I went to church last week, okay? So I think I'm good, right? We, we tend to want to do this, or at least I think as I look at my heart, I tend to want to live in this way. I read... God's word yesterday. Uh, so I don't think there's, uh, I think I'm okay. I, I know I have trusted in Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus. He's my savior. That's something I have done, even while it's something that I may not necessarily be currently trusting or, or seeking. There's a, a part of us that seeks to depend upon what we have already encountered with Christ without that continuing in the presence. We're lazy, I guess, spiritually. Uh, we're prone to wander uh, away. We're, 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 we find it easier to just rely on something that I've already done. So now I, 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 I can take that uh, and I can take a little bit of a break and do make some space for other stuff that I want in my life. I think that's what Jesus is telling us. Don't do that. Abide in my word. We don't need to just come to church last week or last month. We need Christ today. We need to hear from him. We need to heed what he says. We need to obey him today. Not just, well, I served last week. I did a measure of service to Christ uh, so I think I'm good. Now we can continue to hear his word and, and heed it. And then there's another part uh, of abiding as well. In verse uh, 9, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. What does it say? Abide in my love. So there's abiding in his words and abiding in his love. Now, what does it mean to abide in Christ's love? It's 
Keep keeping his commandments. Keeping his commandments. Now, here's a good question. By keeping, is, is keeping Christ's commandments how we abide in his love? Or is it an outcome of abiding in his love? Okay. Why do you say that? I agree. I think you're I think you're accurate in that. Why is it an outcome rather than a means of, of abiding in Christ? Yeah, yes, for sure. Uh, but if if we miss that it's an outcome, does that not distort our relationship uh, with with them? Why 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 is it an outcome? You, not, you can't just feel his love. You have to show his love. Sure. So we're feeling his love by abiding in his commandments, but we need to show his love by being part to, to distribute his love to others. Yeah. Actually live it. Okay. Not just believe it. We have to live it. Live it out. Okay. Uh, let me go, Dave and uh, Kevin. Uh, I think we used the word a little bit ago about indwelling. Yes. And that indwelling, we have to really think about it because it's him and me one all together, right? Tight together. Yeah. It's I and him and he's in me. So we have it. We got it. We don't. We try to find it quickly. Yeah. Um, the indwelling word says... Than... Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, the the word is indwelling in us. Okay. Uh, uh, good. Uh, very good. Uh, yeah. So, so it's it's a it's a show of of the inward heart change. Yes. The the obedience because you can obey God's commands without being connected to and abiding yeah. in Him. And that's mm -hmm. throughout the Bible. You know, God says through Isaiah that our good works are nothing but filthy rags, and then Paul warns Timothy and um, probably it's about um, wolves in sheep clothing who are, are outwardly appearing to be obedient but are, are leading people astray. Yeah. And so the, the obedience that we show, you can obey the commandments, you can be faithful to your husband or wife and not covet other things without being connected to God. Uh, the, the true obedience that would actually bear eternal fruit, which is what Jesus is talking about here in John, is a humble submission to God and putting him first, and that comes from a heart change and then produces the obedience rather than the other way around, which is parasitical, where we obey in order to seem like we are more righteous. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that in a way, isn't it also in a way another shortcut? God, I'll do what you, you want. You know, I'll go to church. I have no problem with that. You know, I'm a scheduled person, like to keep uh, things. I, I'll do all those things. But for it to not really come from an abiding uh, connection to Christ, which is the heart uh, of the two. Uh, like, there's an aspect of me. I can do stuff. I can serve. I can be grumbling and complaining about it. Like, I got to do all, you know, we, we can do stuff. Uh, and we can even do it with a pleasant attitude uh, as well. But but not out of reliance uh, on Christ. And the, 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 the clue, the helpful um, uh, part of this passage to me that this is coming out of uh, my, the, my obedience to Christ, obeying his commands is, is yes, a, a means that connects me to Christ, but it, it's coming, it has to come out of, of my dependence upon him is because this is rooted in the relationship that Christ has to his father in verse 8 um, or, or in verse 9 it is, uh, just as the father has loved me I have also loved you. So does the father love the son because the son does what the father says, the commands? Right? Now, Jesus was perfectly obedient to the father, but is that the basis of the father's love for the son? No, the father loves the son. They have, uh, he has eternally loved the son. And the son obeys the father. He's in the father's love. So in the same way, when we abide in Christ, and in his love, uh, we are trusting, we are recognizing his love for us. And it, it is bearing its fruit in our obedience to him. Uh, we can obey Christ without loving him. Many people do the things that Christ uh, commands us to do without any love for Christ. But the kind of obedience, the kind of uh, congregation, kind of people that he's forming is that we are we are responding to his love. We're trusting his love 
and responding in faithful obedience uh, to him. We have to abide. We have to remain. Our heart is not naturally inclined to remain in relationship with that which is good. Yeah. If we stop abiding and remaining, we will experience a disconnect yeah. and forget. Yes. Yeah, we are all prone to that. We are prone to wander. That, that uh, hymn is so true. Uh, very, very prone uh, to wander. Yeah. There's a big difference between the head attitude and the heart attitude. Mm -hmm. My head says, this is what you do. But my heart is right with him. I'll do it because of my love for him. Yeah. Yeah. This is Jesus' instructions uh, on a congregation, how a congregation should function. There's another aspect of it. Uh, back in verse uh, chapter 13. Uh, let's uh, look at this. On the night uh, before Jesus died, um, they gather for the uh, Passover, and uh, John records this. Uh, I don't believe that this is recorded in the other um, Gospels. Uh, he, he cleans their feet, um, uh, and he, do he does this as an example uh, uh, for them. He says that this, uh, he, that he, he's cleaning, he's serving them. He's their teacher. He's their master, uh, the one who they are following. In verse 12, when he had washed their feet and taken his uh, garments and reclined at the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done uh, to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right. For so I am. If then, uh, uh, if I then the Lord, uh, if I then the Lord and the teacher washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did uh, uh, to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, the slave is not greater than his master, neither is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. And then he goes on uh, in verses uh, 34, 35. This is the context kind of giving you the, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Now, uh, on the night before he dies, he gives this new commandment. Now, good question that uh, comes to my mind, and maybe to yours. How is this a new commandment? Did not the law already stipulate to love your neighbor as yourself? Had he not already taught uh, love your enemies uh, in uh, Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6, Matthew 6, I believe. Uh, had he not already uh, and then see the second greatest uh, commandment summarized is love your neighbor as yourself, right after love the Lord your God with all your heart. How is this a new commandment? Then he says, This is a new commandment I am giving you love one another. Now, it sounds like he had talked about that before. So, what is new about this commandment that he is giving uh, on this night? It's a lot more proactive. Okay. If you think neighbors back at back home to the wander away, a little bit. Yeah. And it's and it's love. There's a whole difference, like love as I have loved you. Yeah. Not as love as, as you love yourself, but as I have loved you. Yeah. As you know, I mean everything that he has done and everything that he had done, it's just the whole different love. It went from a selfish tendency out of obedience and um not having to look forward to consequence of not obeying to a selfless yeah. act out of his example. Yeah. Okay. He was ready to die for them. Yes. So he was trying to prepare them. Yeah. This is really is the extent I want to go to. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think you're kind of touching on what seems to be a new aspect of this. Who's the example? Who's the model for our love for one another? Christ. It's Christ. That's a pretty lofty example. Uh, uh, something like that we have not seen before. No one had seen before. Uh, so there seems to be, what's new about this command? There's a new pattern. There's a new pattern in Jesus Christ that, that he laid down for us. He, he displayed it in washing of the feet. He's going to display it even uh, 
more significantly, uh, vastly, uh, unimaginably great in his suffering and death on the cross. He didn't make himself greater than others. He humbled himself to become a servant, yeah. to wash your feet. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful way of stating that this picture that he has, that uh, through whom the world has been created. We are not greater than Jesus no. in, in what we are able to do in our purity, in any aspect of, of our being. And yet he comes and he serves, he washes feet, he dies. He also then goes on from that point and this launch again of like the brief discussion. And then he goes on to explain that he is the way, the truth, and the light, the vine. He explains God's Father. He explains himself that he's greater love is known as the way down to life. He's explaining the death of the Son. And then he goes on and explains the Holy Spirit in John 6. Yes. And so he, like, this is like the introduction to his greatest explanation of the Trinity and every yeah. aspect of God's love actually coming into fruition before he goes to the cross. Yeah, yep. Uh, there's all of these things that are, are are tied and connected and woven together. Really, uh, uh, well, well, you know, kind of. Uh, he's he, the new command has this new pattern, and and it's also th this new people. Jesus is <laughs> is giving a command for a new people. You recognize this by this. By the way that you guys love one another, everybody else is going to know you're my disciples. There, there is a new people that Jesus is forming uh, by his love, by his sacrifice. And not only that, there's a, a provision uh, for, for this. Uh, the, the power to love in this way is going to be provided. So in, in uh, chapter 15, which we already looked at, uh, if you, um, uh, verse, let me see, uh, verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. And this love uh, for, for you, kind of grounded, again, in this love uh, of the Father, in verse 9, the Father has loved me, so I also have loved you, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Uh, so uh, what we need in order to love one another is not only just the pattern of Christ, it is the power of Christ in us. To recognize that. It's not just his example. We don't need just good examples. We need them, for sure. But we need something more than just good examples. We need the ability to live what we see before us. We need the power of Christ and the love of the Father that dwells in him and his love for us to indwell us and work itself out in how we treat one another. If we do not do this, we will be a weak, ineffective church, congregation. People will not look at us and see Jesus. They will not have a better sense of who Jesus is and what he has done for them. If they do not see the way that we love one another is also the way that Christ has loved us. And then, as you referred to, I, I'll try to, we don't have time, I'm not going to try to go into it. Uh, the Spirit then is provided uh, for us. Uh, is got Christ's grace provision that we would have the power to not only love one another, but to live in this truth, to remain in Christ, to stay connected to him. And so I, I think we'll maybe just look at that uh, briefly in the, the next time that, that we get together. I think those are good. Maybe they're simple. I, I know they're simple. I, I know, and, and I think we are familiar with them before. And so it's just perhaps by way of reminder, as a church, a congregation, uh, to be healthy and effective to what Christ had called us to do and to be requires to abide in and to remain connected to his word, to rely on his love, to allow it to be what, what energizes and motivates our life, lives and services, and then to love one another, which again is coming from Christ, his pattern, and it's also his power at work in us. And then we'll look at the spirit uh, a bit next time. Let's conclude by uh, relying on him going. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word.
<laughs> and thank you for Christ and for what he has provided in his example and in his love for us. Now he has formed us into the, his body uh, to fulfill what you have given us for the glory. We ask that we remain in Christ. That we would not base our spiritual lives so much on what we have done, but who we are currently trusting in, who we are obeying in, in Christ. That your love would fill us, would work through us, Lord. We would be able to love one another by Christ's love. It would not be just our own ability or just trying to blindly, uh, self-sufficiently do what you have said for us to do, but that it would be coming from uh, remaining connected to Christ. His word, his love, at work in us, Lord. We ask this in his name. Amen.